All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are so grateful for you taking the time to join us today for the 2022 United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. This side panel is sponsored by the George Washington University, as well as the Gender Equality Initiative in International Affairs, GEIA, which convenes the Elliott School of International Affairs curriculum, scholarly research, and engagement in the policy and practice of promoting and achieving gender equality globally. This year's priority theme of the United Nations is achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. From Southeast Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa and from Bangladesh to Mozambique, climate change is adversely impacting the physical, mental, sexual and reproductive and emotional health and well-being of women and girls around the world. Although governments may recognize gender equality as a principle, unless gender is systematically integrated into laws and policies with clear directions, guidelines, and goals, little impact will be had on women and girls. Our panelists today were selected to present their secondhand research in the region of their choosing to better understand the gendered effects of climate change. We will also present policy recommendations to enact tangible change where women are not only seen as victims of climate change, but active and effective agents and promoters of adaptation and mitigation. We want to take a moment to acknowledge the land we are on. We are hosting this panel from the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples who have served as stewards of the District of Columbia for generations. DC borders the confluence of the Anacostia and Potom Potomac rivers, a historic center of trade and cultural exchange between several tribal nations. Their people continue to thrive in the region and still honor and celebrate their culture and relationship with the land. Before we jump in, I'd also like to take a moment of silence to acknowledge all victims and survivors of violence, including those fleeing the war in Ukraine. Thank you. Now I'll pass it over to Jessa to provide some logistics. Thank you. So before we begin, here's a brief overview of what we have planned for this next hour and a half. We'll first take a few minutes to introduce ourselves as both students and panelists. Then we'll jump into our research and provide our research findings on climate change and gender equality from each of our respective countries or regions. After, we'll propose our joint recommendations that we work to craft together as a panel, which target three spheres of influence. So first, the national government, Second, international organizations such as the United Nations. And third, non-state actors such as women's NGOs, civil society organizations, and community-based organizations. Finally, we will open up the last half hour to an audience Q&A. It is important to mention that all questions should go to the Q&A feature on Zoom and not in the chat. This will help keep us organized and the questions will be visible to all panelists and attendees. Also, we encourage you to introduce yourself and your affiliation when you ask a question. If you'd like to ask questions privately, you can message um, the host and participants in the chat. And lastly, if you have any other questions regarding this panel throughout the event, feel free to message us in the chat and we will be keeping an eye on it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessa. So let's jump into introductions now. I can kick us off. My name is Lily Lamatina and I'm a senior at George Washington University. I am pursuing my BA in International Affairs with a concentration in Asia and Global Public Health. I'm a research assistant at the Seeger Center for Asian Studies at George Washington. I'm also a research intern at the Stinson Center's Southeast Asia program, where I focus on sustainable energy and environmental security in the Mekong region, which includes the countries of China, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam. My background and academic passions lie in East and Southeast Asia. Two issues I care deeply about are climate change and gender equality. It's a great privilege to be able to participate on this panel to convey the intersection of these two issues in the context of Asia, where I was born. Uh, I apply a gender lens to my analysis, which is crucial to underscoring the disproportionate impacts facing women and girls. I look forward to sharing my recommendations and discussing with you all. And now I'll pass it over to Jessica. Hi, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, I'm Jessa Davidson. I'm a junior at GW in the Elliott School of International Affairs, majoring in international affairs with a concentration in conflict resolution. Um, I'm actually currently studying abroad in Freiburg, Germany, and that's where I'm calling in from today. 
So here in Germany, I'm participating in a program that focuses on the European Union and its relation to and role um, and role in different member states. So in terms of my interest in women's rights and gender equality, I've always had a passion for these topics as a political student, as a woman, and as a human. So through my concentration in conflict resolution, I've had a front row seat at seeing how every conflict and every aspect of life disproportionately affects and harms women, a conversation that is largely insufficiently discussed in the daily and academic spheres. But last semester, the course Women in Global Politics allowed me the space to use my existing knowledge and experiences to further explore these disparities, especially concerning climate change. In this meeting, I'm gonna be diving into the findings regarding climate change's negative effects on women's sexual and reproductive rights in Bangladesh. And then together, we will all discuss a pathway forward. All right, take it away, Annie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annie Lin, and I am a third year undergraduate student studying international affairs with a concentration in international development here at the Elliott School. Um, currently, I'm a fellow at the Global Campaign for Education US, where I support global education advocates in championing uh, inclusive education for all, um, including women and girls. Um, so last semester, I also had the opportunity to take Professor Shirley Graham's Women in Global Politics course and had the opportunity to really combine my interest in gender equality and youth development through conducting secondary research and writing a paper on the impacts of climate change on child marriages, particularly in rural Mozambique, which is a region that experiences both frequent cl uh, climate change related natural disasters uh, and extremely high rates of child marriages. So in my research paper, I explore the ways uh, in which the climate crisis is exacerbating the devastating health consequences of child marriages, uh, especially for women and girls who are particularly vulnerable and so as we move our way through the 66th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, I want to thank you all for allowing me to share this space with you uh, and bring awareness to this really important issue. Um, and I also wanna thank the numerous women-led organizations, particularly those led by underrepresented uh, women of color in gender uh, equity and international development spaces who have done the groundwork to collect research, uh, data and gather stories from women and girls who have been directly uh, affected by climate change um, and child marriages. Over to you, Emma. Good afternoon. My name is Emma Stenzel and I'm a sophomore at the George Washington University studying international affairs with a concentration in security policy and minors in history in Russia. I am also currently the director of philanthropy for the Alpha Pi chapter of Alpha Delta Pi in which I have been able to organize fundraising events to raise money for the Ronald McDonald House charity. I am also a student consultant at MZD Ventures, where I've had the opportunity to work with both a nonprofit agribusiness in Africa that aims to increase women's access to economic opportunities and my own organization in expanding internal communications. Since my energy focused physics class in my freshman year of university, I've taken a special interest in the role energy plays in everyday life. I never realized how important access to energy was in order to fulfill all the tasks needed to live, such as heating and cooling my home, preparing food, being able to turn the lights on at night, and so many more operations. Therefore, I focus on the impact of climate change on women and girls' access to energy, specifically for those living in rural areas. I'm very excited to discuss with you the impact climate change has on women and girls' health all across the globe. I also want to thank everyone for joining us here today to talk about such an important issue. Thank you, Emma. So now jumping into our research, while each of us focuses on different countries or regions of the world, there is a lot of overlap among the problems and causes that we sought to build off of when creating recommendations. Uh, so my research travels 9,000 miles across the globe from Washington DC all the way to Southeast Asia, which is a regional hotspot for climate change risk. And that is due to the high prevalence of climate related disasters, the dependence on seasonal rains for water and food security, and you know, a host of other factors, including high poverty rates, inequality, uh, we're seeing the rapid urbanization of cities and the unsustainable natural resource use. Rising sea levels threaten the 77% of Southeast Asians who live along the coast or in low-lying river deltas. At the same time, the direct threats of sea level rise and superstorms will compound uh, food and water insecurity throughout the region. These combined impacts will likely cause widespread permanent migration that transcends international borders 
and increases the likelihood of regional instability. So all of these impacts, which will disproportionately affect the poorest and most marginalized communities will have extreme consequences on the health and communities in Southeast Asia. Uh, so while climate change affects everyone, the most vulnerable to climate change and its negative health consequences in developing countries are women. Climate change has an acute impact on women's health, which is exacerbated due to existing gender power imbalances and marginalization. It's actually estimated that the mortality risk of women during climate disasters is 14 times higher than that of men. And the gender gap effects of life expectancy tend to be greater in more severe disasters, uh, as well as in places where the socioeconomic status of women is particularly low, like in Southeast Asia. Uh, women and girls are exposed to various health risks that are likely to be exacerbated by climate change, pr primarily related to WASH, which stands for Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene, uh, as well as sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, air pollution, diet and nutrition, uh, and of course, physical safety. Uh, a key driver of WASH risk is the widespread lack of secure access to clean, safe water or consumption. Um, you know, women have to consume and use polluted water, and this causes them to be more susceptible to sexual and reproductive health problems. Uh, this is especially the case for pregnant women, and this is something that uh, Jessica will go into more detail about later. In addition, disruption to sanitation systems makes it extremely difficult for women and girls dur during menstruation. They cannot access clean water for washing and personal hygiene, uh, and many schools don't have private or separate facilities um, and bathrooms for girls. Uh, lastly, um, you know, my last point is that women and girls face the increased risk of domestic violence and sexual assaults following disasters, particularly in internally displaced persons, IDP camps, uh, by other refugees and male residents acting either individually or in gangs. The frustration of camp life can lead to violence, including sexual abuse within the interpersonal relationship and the family as well. Um, and once on the move as climate refugees, Women are also at risk of being brutalized by human traffickers or even border security forces. Uh, alarmingly, this abuse can come at the hands of National Migration Administration or even humanitarian staff, which has um, been studied as well. So women's vulnerability is further amplified uh, as support networks, including family and friends and relevant government and NGOs to protect women in the first place may become um, inaccessible in disaster situations. So before I stop here, I, I just want to underscore that gender differences in disaster related health risks are not at all attributed uh, to physical differences between men and women. Existing political, socioeconomic and cultural imbalances and patriarchal norms around the world are what render women more vulnerable to the devastating impacts of climate change. There was a 2009 uh, UN State of the World population report uh, which concluded that the sex differences in climate disaster related mortality are actually directly influenced by gender inequalities in the socioeconomic status and the degree to which women enjoy economic and social rights. The report also affirms that in countries where men and women enjoy comparable status, natural disasters pretty much affect them almost equally. So you see here the distinct roles and relations of men and women in a given culture dictated by that culture's gender norms and values give rise to gender differences. And that's the main point that we're trying to make. Gender norms, roles, and relations um, you know, give rise to gender inequalities. As a result, women are more likely to live in poverty than men. They have less access to um, you know, basic human rights, like the ability to freely move and acquire land. Uh, they face systemic violence that escalates during periods of instability. Both gender differences and gender inequalities can give rise to inequities between men and women in their health status. And uh, in many instances, gender restriction isolates women from access to communication and information. This also hinders early disaster warnings to reach women in a timely manner. So in a survey conducted by the World Agroforestry, data revealed that there was a difference between men and women on their level of awareness just about climate change, where 60% of women being unaware of climate change compared to 36% of men. This discrepancy is tied to underlying patriarchal norms that exclude women and create unequal access to uh, knowledge, resources, uh, training, and political participation. 
Women also have limited access and control over resources such as land, uh, property, energy, job training, which impedes efforts to the response in the face of climate change. Uh, furthermore, gender norms and restrictions often place an unequal burden on women in the face of disaster. Gender rural restriction, for example, does not allow women in some cultures to learn to swim due to notions of modesty. Uh, this puts them at risk, of course, for drowning during floods or typhoons. Uh, and in addition, women and girls are likely uh, expected to take care of the young or sick family members, as well as look for food and water for the household. So during climate disasters, this hardship is multiplied when women and girls have to travel longer distances to fetch water and look for food or firewood. firewood. Uh, this deprives them of the time which they need to care for their own personal health and hygiene, and also the time to access health care services. So this added hardship also affects women's mental and emotional health. Uh, you know, therefore, just in addressing the disproportionate uh, health impacts of climate change facing women and girls, it's essential to ensure gender response and mitigation and adaptation as well as target the you know, underlying gender imbalances and patriarchal norms, which underpin that specific society and culture. Thank you. And thank you for pointing out that this vulnerability is due to these patriarchal norms, because I think that is so important. Um, so Lily just spoke about also about the disparate impact of climate change in Southeast Asia and the grave risk these women are facing every day. I'm now going to zero in on the women of Bangladesh. So travel with me to the south of Asia, to the riverine country of Bangladesh. If we actually just landed in Bangladesh, you'd be standing in a deltaic plain, which is pretty flat land at the mouth of a river or river system. And this land is where the river deposits its sediment load. So as you can imagine, this geography makes Bangladesh incredibly vulnerable to frequent flooding, which is further exacerbated by climate change. In fact, Bangladesh's geography makes it one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the effects of climate change. Now I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Women, compared to their male counterparts, are always disproportionately affected by conflict, policies, international law, national law, the coronavirus, and well, every aspect of life. Climate change is no exception. And as we all learned in kindergarten, secret secrets are no fun. So let's get serious and open up this conversation about climate change's disparate impact on the sexual and reproductive rights and health of the Bangladeshi women. I'm going to focus and bring in more specifics on two key areas in which climate change is hurting the Bangladeshi women. Maternal health and access to sexual and reproductive health. Both of these are areas that need rapid and comprehensive responses. So to start, let's talk about maternal health in Bangladesh. Climate change has two primary detrimental effects on maternal outcomes in Bangladesh. The first of which is that rising sea levels and flooding the lowlands fill the groundwater with salt. High levels of salt increase blood pressure in pregnant women, which can result in eclampsia or seizures during pregnancy and can ultimately lead to miscarriages or underweight and malnourished babies. So not only are these women and expecting mothers dealing with the effects of flooding on their physical community and their homes and their families, now their drinking water is unsafe for consumption and could have detrimental effects on their baby's health and survival. The second detrimental effect on maternal health and maternal outcome is the increased risk of waterborne and vector-borne diseases due to greater amounts of standing water. Waterborne diseases such as hepatitis E and acute diarrhea are incredibly dangerous to pregnant women and their fetuses. And vector-borne diseases such as Zika increase the risk of spontaneous abortion, premature delivery, stillbirth, low weight birth, eclampsia, and cesarean deliveries. And so nothing good. Finally, let's discuss the lack of access to sexual and reproductive health services and products. Climate-related disasters directly result in reducing women's access to sexual and reproductive health services and products. Extreme weather can destroy health facilities and infrastructure, which immediately reduces access to sexual and reproductive reproductive health services, such as HIV treatment, emergency contraception, and safe and secure abortion services. 
Additionally, disaster relief kits often don't contain critical sexual and reproductive health medicines and hygiene products, which contribute to poor menstrual hygiene and reproductive and urinary tract infections. So to conclude, I'm gonna give an example of this, which also shows the intersection of all of these ideas. So I'm gonna tell you a brief and true anecdote um, that took place in the aftermath of Cyclone Amphon in 2020. So the roads of Bangladesh were flooded for over nine months um, and health facilities were destroyed with no initiatives to rebuild. Halima Begum was 23 and pregnant at this time and she just went into labor. Her husband had to row her 21.7 miles in a small rowboat just to reach the nearest clinic that was still standing. Halima was one of the lucky ones. She survived, but her baby was very underweight with many health complications. Many women were not even this lucky. It is clear that Bangladeshi women are reaching a state of crisis that needs a rapid, comprehensive response, which we'll discuss later in this panel. Thank you. That is concerning to hear, Jessa, and I look forward to hearing your recommendations. While my fellow panelists focused on specific regions, I looked at the issue of energy overall. The influence of climate stretches across many issues, causing problems in everyone. Climate change has a strong influence on wider issues, such as energy. Energy is a human right, and it is part of the Sustainable Development Goals outlined by the United Nations, specifically Sustainable Development Goal 7, which ensures that everyone has, quote, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy. Energy is a necessary requirement for human survival because of its use in tasks such as heating and food preparation. In many regions around the world, especially in rural areas, people do not have access to energy that is safe and powerful. Energy poverty impacts both men and women, but women to a greater extent because of patriarchal systems that create gender discrimination. Currently, 759 million people in the world, many of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, do not have access to electricity, and 471 million of those people live in rural areas. Many of these areas, approximately 70%, rely on traditional biomass energy, which are plant or animal materials used as fuel to produce electricity or heat. In rural Africa, 91% of homes use fuel that cause pollution and therefore have an effect on the people that live there. These energy sources must be collected, mostly by women, creating a time burden. A study of 22 African countries found that women can spend at a minimum two hours every day collecting fuel. That time has only increased, however, with increased deforestation due to climate change. A study in eastern Botswana found that with less rainfall, there are fewer trees growing and thus less firewood. Therefore, women must travel further distances to gather the same amount of fuel needed for their survival. A consequence of this is the physical toll carrying a large amount of fuel takes in women. Studies have shown spinal deformations from carrying heavy loads in the Congo and miscarriages in Ethiopia. There is also a connection between energy poverty and sexual assault. Although there is not a lot of research done into the subject, Doctors Without Borders has reported treating women who were raped while fetching wood, water, or wood, or while working in the fields in South and West Darfur. In order to make food, energy is also needed, whether manually or automatic. A study of one family in Mali found that on average, 16 women were needed to grind grains by hand, taking a toll on their physical and emotional health. Furthermore, Rising temperatures and drought threatens crop production, resulting in food insecurity and undernutrition. Undernutrition is a major problem amongst women, particularly those in rural areas. However, using wood as the main source of energy has significant environmental impacts with a quarter of global soot emissions coming from traditional cooking stoves, which are not healthy to be around either. Every year, 4.3 million premature deaths, mainly of women and children, are linked to toxic fumes from fuels such as wood, animal waste, and charcoal used for cooking and heating. The use of solid biomass fuels for cooking highly exposes women and girls to health-damaging pollutants, including small soot particles that penetrate deep into the lungs. These illnesses include pneumonia, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and lung cancer due to poor circulation and large amounts of soot, smoke, and soot particles. There's also a risk of burns, poisoning, cataract, and chronic pain that using traditional forms of fuel can cause. The effect of climate change on, has on energy is detrimental to women and girls living in rural areas, and I look forward to discussing some potential solutions to these problems. 
Thank you, Emma. Uh, Emma highlighted some really important uh, points about the uh, energy uh, poverty um, and its linkage between uh, energy poverty and um, gender-based violence. And so I wanted to sort of expand upon this and explore um, another contributor of gender-based violence, um, which is child marriage. So as a uh, gender um, equality advocate and as someone who hopes to um, work in international development in the future, I really believe in the importance of um, amplifying the stories of women and girls. And I think that the UN CSW is the perfect forum to do so. Um, and so um, to start off, um, I wanted to share a story that was reported by the Brides of the Sun, which is an investigative project that was funded by um, the European Journalism Center in an effort to research and raise awareness about the impacts of climate change on child marriages. Um, so today I wanted to share um, one particular story that focuses on a rural Mozambican uh, family's experiences with climate change and child marriages. So for decades, uh, Antonio Mame Jamal had lived, worked, raised his children um, in the Mozambican province of Nampula, he earned most of his income from fishing. Um, however, in recent years, climate change related natural disasters have deteriorated the fishing industry um, significantly in this region and subsequently has uh, limited uh, Antonio's ability to earn an income. And so as the father of young daughters, Antonio was approached by an older man who expressed wishes uh, to marry his 13 year old daughter, Philomena. And Antonio agreed, but not because he necessarily wanted his daughter to uh, marry at such a young age, but because this man had offered uh, to provide his daughter with education in exchange for a marriage agreement. And so knowing that he had extremely limited um, financial resources, Antonio believed that marriage was really the only opportunity that uh, his daughter would have to receive an education. And the unfortunate reality is that Antonio and Philomena's stories are not unique. In recent years, Mozambique has been significantly uh, affected by uh, uh, climate change, uh, and the consequences are extremely dire as climate change-related natural disasters like droughts and floods have led to the loss of lives and the destruction of homes, increased food insecurity, and financial instability. Uh, throughout the rural regions of Mozambique, um, prolonged uh, droughts have forced numerous families to lose all of their savings and incomes. And so when that happens, in order to minimize the financial burden of caring for their children, many parents will arrange marriages for their young daughters. And I think to really understand the severity of this crisis, we need to recognize that child marriage is forced marriage, right? Um, and although Mozambique has legally banned uh, child marriages, research shows that the country still has uh, one of the highest rates of child marriages. Uh, in Mozambique, one out of two girls under 18 are forced into marriage. By the age of 18, 48% uh, are married. And around by the age of 14 or 15, 14% uh, are married. And so these women and girls who are affected by child marriages are particularly vulnerable to physical and emotional violence in the home, which is one of the most common types of gender-based violence. Um, and research shows that girls who marry before the age of 18 are more likely to experience domestic violence in the home. So in the majority of these cases, men, um, which often includes the groom or the um, bride's father um, are often the ones who negotiate the uh, marriage agreement and have total control over the agreement, meaning that women have very little say um, through this process. And so when you have this gender imbalance, this power imbalance um, combined with patriarchal norms, it contributes to higher risks of physical and emotional um, violence. And in particularly in rural regions of uh, Mozambique, young girls in child marriages are often isolated from their uh, immediate family. So their mom, their dads, their siblings. And so they don't have the option to simply leave their marriage. Um, for 
most victims of child marriages, um, physical and emotional violence um, is very common. And this, of course, affects the physical well-being of women and girls, but it also affects the mental health of uh, women and girls, which I think is an area that is often overlooked in uh, these discussions. Um, research shows that child marriages are often associated with higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, anxiety, which for many are lifelong uh, mental illnesses. And in many countries and regions where um, high rates of uh, child marriages, um, where there are high rates of child marriages, it's simply impossible for victims to access mental health care because their experiences of violence are so normalized and therefore often not reported or uh, dismissed by the justice system and um, even by their community and their family and friends. Um, so currently the threat of violence for women and girls um, in child marriages is particularly pressing. So right on one hand, we're seeing this increase in climate change related natural disasters that are exacerbating poverty, which we know then leaves uh, young girls vulnerable to forced child marriages. On the other hand, we have the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, right, which has further contributed to economic instability and therefore uh, increases the threat of child marriages and gender based violence in the home. And so when you have this combination of climate change compounded with COVID-19, uh, this leaves millions of young girls at risk of becoming uh, victims of child marriages um, and uh, gender-based violence. I think there was a UNICEF report that came out last year that said that, reported that I think due to the pandemic, um, within the next decade, 10 million more girls are at risk of becoming victims of um, child marriages. So that just goes to show the um, severity of the situation. Thank you, Annie. That was very insightful and brought forward a lot of alarming problems that we will now address. So now that we've laid out many of the problems surrounding climate change in relations to women's health, um, we're going to discuss solutions because we have to solve all of this. So the dire impact that climate change will have across the globe requires immediate policy action that will reduce the disproportionate health burden on women and girls. The following recommendations that we're gonna talk through um, and that we've collaborated to make um, are going to provide pathway to ensure that gender responsive mitigation and adaptation to climate change are created. So we're gonna, again, touch on three spheres of influence that are essential to rectifying this disparate impact and meeting the needs of women and girls in the face of climate change. So the first that we're gonna to touch on is the national governments in this level. Next, the international organizations such as the United Nations and third, non-state actors such as women's NGOs, civil society organizations and community-based organizations. So Lily, can you tell us about what has been done at the national level thus far and start the conversation surrounding national solutions? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so in an effort to respond to climate change, countries have signed the Paris Agreement. Um, as, part of, as part of the commitment, states are required to implement the National Adaptation Plan, the NAP, and or the National Adaptation Programs of Action, the NAPA. So in order to safeguard women and girls' health, it's really essential that these programs I just mentioned, as well as the national policies on climate change are gender responsive. All uh, UN agencies must work together to provide the te uh, technical and financial assistance to countries to revise their NAPs and their NAPAs to start including women's health. Um, the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, with the assistance of UN women, should also develop um, and monitor and hold states accountable for uh, developing and implementing gender-sensitive NAPs. Yeah, and I think to add on to Lily's point, um, ensuring that national policies and uh, strategies um, include gender inclusive language is really important to making sure that the actual implementation of these policies and programs on climate change are gender responsive. Um, and it's also really important to ensure that national policies and strategies on issues that particularly affect women and girls, for example, child marriage, um, include climate change in its language uh, because 
gender equality simply cannot be achieved without uh, climate responsive solutions. And so to provide an example, um, in 2015, Mozambique uh, adopted the national strategy to prevent and combat child marriage, which set out a series of uh, strategies that are needed to end child marriages. Um, and while this is a really important step forward, um, I think it's really critical for Mozambique to include um, climate change specifically as a part of its language in the strategy given that climate change is such a major contributor to child marriage. Yeah, Annie, I completely agree with all of that. And also another way to reduce the rate of early marriage and the associated sexual and reproductive health risks is that the government must undertake reforms outlawing um, the practice and providing economic support to the girls um, and their families that are affected by this because a lot of these, like you mentioned before, a lot of these marriages boil down to desperation of the families of needing to survive and support and not having the funds. So additionally, the national government with the help um, with the help of women must be pressured to integrate sexual and reproductive health and rights into climate change policies in these regions directly. So meaning that emergency funds must be allocated for the repair of damaged facilities, the construction of temporary facilities um, during repairs and the inclusion of hygiene products and aid and emergency kits. So in Bangladesh, for instance, a tangible change that the government can make and that they can allocate funds for to protect maternal health is enact legislation to create um, a filtration system to remove salt from the drinking water. So these filtration systems would also help reduce the risk of waterborne diseases from drinking the contaminated flood water and help um, women to reduce the effects of climate change. Building off of this, I think we also need to discuss energy in this conversation, because this aspect often gets overlooked and is underfunded by many governments. In order to realize women's human rights, governments must invest in sustainable and modern energy infrastructure in rural areas. This can be accomplished through either public or private operations. However, for the private sector, governments must incentivize businesses to invest in rural energy solutions and to hold them accountable for providing modern energy to those areas. Because currently, these regions are being neglected to, due to their lack of beneficial economic output. Without the government involvement in ensuring rural areas receive the energy they deserve, private businesses will not invest in building the infrastructure necessary to uphold human rights, especially regarding women's health. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in here again, um, because I think you know we're talking so much about national strategies and I think for states that have already taken steps um, you know, to integrate gender equality into their national strategies, they can do that and then just say, you know, we're done, we did it, um, but it, it's not enough. And the implementation of gender strategies is often very weak and that's due to unclear policies, um, unclear guidelines and uh, the capacity of officials in translating the policy direction in those strategies into specific action. So I think the, the main thing to highlight here is that governments should develop clear guidelines and requirements on how to mainstream gender and send that to all local and respective agencies. Uh, also, in order to build awareness and capacity, the government should also train staff on how to integrate gender equality into policies. These agencies could involve uh, you know, gender specialists and other organizations working on gender issues, such as UN Women, um, in developing monitoring and evaluation frameworks, which is so important to track uh, gender into climate policies. Uh, yeah, and, and the last thing I'll just say is that the meaningful participation of women with diverse backgrounds in climate change mitigation and ad adaptation is essential to improving health outcomes. Uh, women, um, you know, in these sorts of discussions that we're having are very often only viewed as the victim in the face of climate change, and that's how, you know, those discussions are framed. This focus, though, on, um, on their uh, vulnerability uh, reinforces gender stereotypes rather than actually empowering women in policy making. Uh, I think government should really work to ensure uh, the gender balance in their political composition um, and support capacity building for women of diverse backgrounds um, in, order to, uh, in order to engage in climate decision making. I completely agree. I think in terms of energy, there really too needs to be an increase in the number of women working in the energy sector. And I think that this will uh, provide the necessary emphasis on women's energy needs 
that will really result in the essential change that's needed to happen. So that was all at the national level, but now I think we need to take a look at the international community because they also um, have an obligation to help protect and empower women in the face of climate change. International organizations such as the United Nations um, must coordinate the enactment, strengthening and empowerment um, and enforcement of laws and regulatory frameworks related to the intersection of climate change, sexual and reproductive health rights and women's rights. Yeah, um, you know, right on, Jessa. And I think one step that international development organizations can take is to systematically integrate women's human rights and gender equality into their organizational structures, um, into their processes for uh, project approval, um, the implementation processes, and public participation mechanisms. The, the financial mechanism of the UNFCCC should prioritize funding adaptation projects which are specifically gender sensitive and responsive, um, as well as emphasizing women's and girls' health and empowerment. Yeah, Lily brings up a really great point about funding because funding is so critical to implementing uh, gender sensitive and uh, responsive adaptation projects. Um, but I think in order to effectively advocate for increased funding, we need more research um, and data collection um, that can improve understanding, understandings of the differentiated uh, human rights impacts of climate change on women and help leaders make uh, careful decisions regarding uh, funding allocations. Um, so like within the context of child marriages, um, government ministries um, should collaborate with public institutions with grassroots uh, organizations on the ground to collect more um, research on the impacts of uh, climate change um, on child marriage rates and making sure um, that this research is up to date um, because this will allow uh, leaders to just have a better understanding about how climate change is affecting um, child marriages, what regions uh, have been most affected and really how to implement um, solutions uh, that uh, address um, both the issue of child marriage uh, and climate change for um, the most vulnerable women and girls. Andy, I second that. Research is just essential to fixing these important problems. Speaking specifically on energy, the health effects women must endure from traditional forms of energy can be prevented by the increased collection of gender disaggregated data. Gender disaggregated data is data that has been gathered and compiled by gender to specifically look into how it affects women. By seeing the specifics, this should sufficiently demonstrate the energy needs women affect women required of women and all the problems that women face with energy poverty, which are different than the problems men face. In addition, more contemporary data needs to be gathered. Most data concerning the impact of energy poverty on women is from the early 2000s and is therefore outdated. In order to cause substantive change, new data must be gathered. All right, next we are going to move down from the national and international level to non-state actors. Non-state actors um, you know, include local and international women's groups and NGOs. They include uh, civil society organizations, CSOs, and community-based organizations, um, and they have a key role to play. So these organizations, uh, we believe, should intensify their advocacy and campaigns against gender inequality resulting from cultural norms and practices. Uh, community-based organizations, CBOs, should be mobilized for advocacy and massive awareness on the impact of climate change on women and girls. Uh, these uh, advocacy and awareness campaigns can actually complement the efforts of various government ministries, UN agencies, and um, you know, other development partners. Yeah, I think Lily brings up a really great point about uh, civil society organizations because I think these organizations are really critical uh, to supporting local communities. Um, because they can help um, provide the physical, the emotional, the economic support for women and girls um, affected um, by the climate crisis. Um, so in the context of like my research, um, we see that climate change has exacerbated uh, uh, child marriage rates and deteriorated the physical and emotional health of young girls. Um, and so in order to address the trauma that many victims um, experience, um, women-led, um, particularly women-led um, 
community organizations need to ensure that victims of child marriages um, have access to the affordable and accessible health care that they need and beyond just health um, and other like preventative care, um, economic support. So like housing, food, uh, career training programs are also critical because they um, provide like a safety net for victims to fall back on it um, if they choose to leave um, their marriages um, and possibly leave um, a abusive spouse um, and to become self-reliant. Likewise, the private sector can also help add to the efforts of governments. Many enterprises such as Solar Sisters in Sub-Saharan Africa are working to help alleviate women's energy concerns by focusing on increasing access to sustainable energy systems in rural areas. Specifically, Solar Sisters promotes women's clean energy access in these communities by providing women with the skills to create their own sustainable energy ventures focused on harnessing the power of the sun. Additionally, women also gain economic independence from working with this enterprise. Their work reduces energy poverty and decreases the negative health effects women must deal with. I think that we, it's also important to mention the media's role in all of this in the private sector. Um, so the media has an exponential role and um, has such a large effect on change and raising awareness because the media has the power to call out these governments and call on the international community to address the issues that we all described, as well as drawing in the public and getting the public engaged with all of this. So as we've all seen, a media outcry can force the government's hand and ensure follow through on policies and solutions. And the media is also a means to continue this conversation surrounding this important topic. And that's where individuals can also greatly contribute. Thanks, Jessa. Um, and I guess finally, I just wanted to add that um, it's really important for us as uh, gender equality advocates in this space um, to continue the conversation around climate change um, and women's health. Um, and we have to continue this conversation, not just within the uh, pol policymaking and the advocacy spaces, but also uh, on the in more individual level. So whether that's in the classroom or in um, discussions and forums like these, um, it's very, very critical that we um, push the conversation forward. Um, so with that, I believe we'll be moving on to the question and answer session, uh, keeping, me, keeping in mind that we are undergraduate students, so we're constantly learning. So if you have um, expertise um, in this area, please feel free to share any questions or insights. Um, we're very open. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Shirley Graham and I'm the Director of the Gender Equality Initiative and International Affairs and the professor who taught the course Women in Global Politics that each of these students participated in last fall. And um, so I am going to moderate this portion of our discussion. Thank you. There's a lot of questions coming in. I'm actually hoping we're going to have enough time for them all, but we will do our very best. I'm going to start off with the first question I received, and this is um, specifically for you, Jessa. Can you discuss what internalized misogyny is and how women can internalize patriarchal values and what changes you think need to be made in the political sphere to allow for more women to run for political office? Yeah, definitely. So I have kind of a specific um example that comes to mind when you say that but i want to before i dive into the specifics see if any of my co-panelists has kind of like a broader overview before i'm like bring in bangladesh specifically or i can dive right in yeah Jessa, i i can jump into this um because yeah internalized misogyny is something that we we discuss so much as a class so I, i'm happy to um just provide an overview of that because to, to define it, it's when women subconsciously accept um, sexist stereotypes and ideas. It's um, you know a, a byproduct of years of oppression of women. We're born into a patriarchal society where women are constantly objectified and told um, you know how we're supposed to look and behave, and the result is that women themselves may come to internalize the the sexism and objectification that they face every day. It can range 
um, you know, for not only, um, you know, not being friends with other women because they're quote, too much drama um, to slut shaming fellow women. These are just examples of how it appears in everyday life, but on a more serious note, um, when crimes against women are committed, slut shaming and victim blaming is often what takes place. So instead of holding men accountable, all of the blame is placed on women for the violence that occurred. And so with that in mind, it's up to you know, both men and women to be critical about um, you know, when they're being misogynistic and to do their best to be kinder uh, to themselves and to other women. Yeah, so I'm gonna jump in now with my specifics. So when uh, talking about internalized misogyny and, misogyny and internalized patriarchal values, I thought about this a lot in terms of Bangladesh because Bangladesh has a female prime minister. So when I was doing my research on this, um, I'm reading about all the detrimental effects of climate change on the Bangladeshi women and how um, there's inaction and not an ins and, um, insufficient legislation in terms of rectifying these disparities. And yet there is a female prime minister who's making all of the legislative decisions and the head of state. And so I kind of had um, a little bit of the bewilderment when I thought about this. So the female prime minister, um, Sheikh Hasina, run, is the diplomatic decision of the state. Um, and the main opposition party of Bangladesh is also led by a woman. So it kind of got me deeper and deeper into this, how is this working? But it all circles back to this question of internalized misogyny that just simply placing a woman in power doesn't mean that all um, all disparities and all issues involving women are gonna instantly be solved. Um, and I think that also this can be kind of used as almost an excuse as to not address the issues of the women as saying, kind of looking at it as like female exceptionalism, exceptionalism like, look, we have a female prime minister, we're good, women are representative, they're represented, they're taken care of, we don't have to focus on it, we have a woman in power. Um, but in reality, the Bangladeshi political system is still predominantly um, dictated by men. So their parliamentary system has 350 seats and only 50 of them are reserved and housed by women. So men are still dictating the political system on top of the already internalized patriarchal and um, internalized misogyny that we all have and all need to address in ourselves. Um, so like as Lily was saying, um, men are a very important um, component of this conversation that we need men to be allies in this. We need men to be there and not rely on having um, as having all of the women issues fall on women. Like men are there to be allies and bring these issues to light and continue to work and invite more women to the table and bring um, and make sure that these disparate impacts are being addressed. Um, and I think that we all and all legislators can use more training on this, um, as well as continuing to increase um, the success rates. And while there's been um, progress, not enough. So we have to keep moving forwards and stop um, performative action and make our way towards actually making legislative and tangible change. Thanks, Jessa and Lily. I just wondered if you can um, expand a little more, either of you or anybody else in the panel, in terms of how we can hear more from the most marginalized women and girls and how can we bring them into these processes? Yeah, th thank you, Shirley. Uh, so I think, you know, with regarding what changes need to be made um, in the political sphere to allow more women to run for office, um, you know, efforts to improve female representation in politics have often focused on quotas and reserved shares. But what I think is really needed is a more nuanced approach that tackles the underlying structural barriers that women face as politicians. So. Uh, women politicians continue to, to be at a disadvantage in the way they are covered, specifically in the media um, and in gender-based attacks. I think um, more so than men, women receive coverage that focuses on their background, on um, you know, their family life, on you know, high scrutiny of their physical appearance or the way she is dressed. Uh, when a woman is in a leadership position, we expect her to be tough. However, if she's 
too tough or um, you know too ambitious, she's seen as being um, bossy or opportunistic or feisty. Like those are just some examples of adjectives that are constantly used to describe women in the media. Um, but at the same time, she can't be too soft because then she gets labeled as emotional, of course, or um, you know not not tough enough for the job. So. I think you know what this does is it dissuades women from ent entering uh, the political realm because of gender media reporting. It really dampens other young women's political aspirations. And so we need to be more uh, equitable and representative in our media coverage of women because the media is still so dominated by men. Uh, we need female politicians to support and encourage one another um, during campaigns, but we also need male politicians uh, to not only support other female politicians, but to call out other male politicians when sexist uh, or unfair comments or questions are posed. Okay, thank you for that, Lily. So another question, and I'm just gonna throw out to everybody is that given that the term women includes such diverse groups of people, how can policymakers and advocates work to ensure that responses to climate change recognize and address intersectional identities. Does anybody want to talk a bit more about the intersectionality lens? So um, I can take this yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so I'll just kind of first like define what intersectionality is. Um, it's actually a concept that was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in I believe the 1980s. And it just explains the way and the lens in which different aspects of inequality intersect within your own identity and, and they can exasperate the problems of each other. Um, these aspects include everything from gender to race to sexuality and to so much more. And because these identities are just not, because none of your identities are unidimensional. Um, specifically kind of related to climate change, an example of this would be increased child marriages um, that the rural women face because of their gender and location. And because the ways in which women in rural areas interact with the effects of climate change are different, are very different from how women in urban areas interact with them because they each have intersectional identities. Um, and then to address the way that women in our diverse groups and how we can address the intersectionality that women represent, there is a really big need and a strong need for intersectional analysis in policymaking because policies that support one identity can be inadvertently harming another and without including other dimensions of women identities, inequalities will continue to be reinforced. To address intersectional identities, there needs to be in-depth research and policy analysis, and that'll live to help determine how to best assist everyone and to assist and to ensure that one identity is not being harmed in the uh, pursuit of another. Thank you, Emma. I'm going to turn now to a couple of other questions. Um, so I'm going to um, share this question by Kazumi. Could you elaborate on how climate change is eroding the education of women and girls in addition to their health, if possible? As human development is multidimensional, I'm also interested in the impact of climate change on girls' access to education. So that's one question. And another one, um, how does the international community walk the line between helping and overstepping in national governments and authority? And I'll just read one more, and then you can decide who's going to answer whichever one. Um, so the previous one was from Sophia, and now um, uh, Jose or Jose, how, how would you measure the success of these solutions? Do you think there would have to be drastic changes to these nations' cultures? If you consider patriarchal norms as part of the culture, what mechanisms would there have to be for accountability in these organizations to make sure these goals are actually reached? So thank you for all those questions. We'll answer those first and then we'll come back to the next set. Who wants to start? Whichever one of those questions you're interested in answering. Annie? Yeah, I can tackle um, the question about climate change and how it's eroding um, the education of women and girls. Um, that's such a great question because health, education, women's rights are so interconnected. You almost can't have um, you can't have gender equality without all three. Um, and so, it, for example, um, uh, Emma talked about. Um, uh, energy poverty. And so when you have women and girls who are um, spending hours per day um, trying to fetch 
um, water um, and wood, um, then that is time away from school. Um, and due to um, gender norms, women are often responsible for um, resource collection. Um, and sort of in the realm of uh, child marriages, um, when you have, let's say a natural disaster, um, women and girls are often um, forced to um, enter into a marriage in order to alleviate the financial burdens. Um, and when that happens, um, they are more uh, vulnerable to early pregnancies, right? Um, and when that, when a woman is pregnant, they are more likely to leave school. Um, and even if they wanted to attend school, many, many, um, there are many institutional barriers um, that prevent uh, pregnant learners um, from being able to access uh, school, uh, their education. Um, and I think um, the Global Education Monitoring Report from 2017 really emphasizes uh, the linkage between um, like child marriage and education. Um, they reported that 12 years of education for every girl uh, would reduce child marriage uh, globally by 64%. Um, and so, yeah, you really see like the linkage between uh, education and child marriage. And then I guess another point is that education is so important in providing women and girls the skills um, in the knowledge to um, know how to respond to climate um, related natural disasters. Um, and I think this is where um, I think um, one of the questions was about um, community led initiatives. Um, I can just add a little bit onto that. Um, the importance of having women lead the those educational um, initiatives. Um, I wrote a paper on um, impacts of um, climate change in Kenya, and one of um, one article that I found um, talked about how um, community based initiatives are really successful. You have some um, initiatives that have women led discussions um, where they hold. Um, discussions on how to um, collect water and water management and a new agricultural methods. Um. Thank you, Annie. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on the question of community-led responses, but I'm just going to pose that one there. And then I'm going to um, ask Amalia's question. Um, so Kazumi asks that other question about community-led responses and Amalia asks, how do national governments' relationships with women's civil society affect the outcomes for women in all of your country cases? So how are these organizations and communities helped or hurt by national efforts? And how can the international community's relationship with governments help or harm grassroots efforts? And um, so that's another one um, that somebody might want to take on. And then I'm just gonna take one more from Tiffany. So you have a moment to think who's going to answer what. And Tiffany just says, excellent job. And what are some practical steps that everyday folks can take to advocate for some of the policy and systems changes you reference? Okay, Jessa. Yeah, so I want to circle back to the question regarding how the international community walks the line um, between helping and overstepping in national governments and authority. Um, because I've actually thought a lot about this question, not only um, for my research for this paper and this um, panel, but also just um, in everyday life and with majoring in international affairs, this comes up repeatedly because it's just it dictates how dictates how states interact with other states, how inter the international community responds to various crises. So it, um, it's constantly this um, question resurfaces. So I've thought about this a lot and I don't necessarily have a concrete answer, but I'm gonna walk you through um, my thought process on this. Um, so on the one hand, the international community has the responsibility responsibility to protect, which was um, adopted in 2005 at the United Nations World Summit. This um, responsibility to protect and respond to different, to like genocide, crimes against humanity, um, things along those lines. So under this obligation is for the international community to respond to crimes against humanity, which there can be an argument made um, in terms of climate change about whether crimes against humanity are being committed. Um, and then on the other hand, states have autonomy and sovereignty, which prevents the interference from outside states um, 
from outside states interfering in their legislation. So, and then that also brings up on this hand is, can we clearly say with full certainty that um, the lack of action or lack of sufficient action is a crime against humanity? So basically on one hand, you have this R2P, this responsibility to protect the international community of needing to interfere in some capacity and in, state, in a state's business that's committing a crime against humanity. And on the other hand, you have the states that possess sovereignty, which inherently prevents other states from interfering without explicit permission and invitation from that state's government. Um, and we also have the whole debate of is this lack of action or insufficient accent action considered a crime against humanity, which is a debate for a completely other forum because we could talk about that for two hours. But I think that the best way to answer this question and to walk this line, which is a very fragile line, is to bypass and bypass this question is for um, the international community to support the work of civil society and NGOs within these states that are working to remedy the situation already. Um, the women and girls in these states um, that are directly affected by climate change and the detrimental effects of climate change know what they need. Um, and it's the international community's job and the national government's job to invite these women and girls to the table and empower their voices to allow them to tell us what they need because they know. And the UN can provide guidance, support and regulatory framework, but it must be in coordination with these women and girls to avoid this overstepping into the national um, government's authority. And the UN can also um, call on the national government to enact and advance legislation and enforcement of legislation that benefit these women and protect their rights and access to health. But again, this has to be hand in hand with the women on the ground that are being directly affected. So overall, um, it's gonna be in order for the international community to walk this very shaky tightrope, they're gonna need to be working in a collaborative form with the national government and with the women that know what they need that are being affected and that deserve a seat at the table. Yeah, and uh, just to hop in here, that's exactly how I would have answered um, Jose's question as well um, about if you think there needs to be uh, you know, drastic changes to these nations' cultures. Um, absolutely not. We're definitely not looking to change another nation's culture. Um, what we're trying to acknowledge here is that we're not just trying to you know, mitigate um, the vulnerability of women and girls and support women and girls, but also address you know, the more long-term underlying issues that render women and girls more vulnerable in the face of climate change in the first place. Um, it's definitely not the job of the international community or the U.S. to impose its own values on another culture, uh, but in terms of monitoring and evaluation, and you know, um, I think you asked two mechanisms uh, for accountability. Yeah, like you know, talking to those women directly about how they feel, what they want, what they think needs changing, what they don't want to be changed, and working on the ground with those local community-based um, organizations and putting people at the center of the of the solutions. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, so we have a couple of other questions here that we haven't gotten around to yet. Um, well, Chris asked the question, which is really following on from what we've been discussing earlier on how can we all as individuals contribute to conversations about the effects of climate change for women and girls' health? Um, and also Bethany asked the question. She says, thank you so much for the fantastic presentations. And I wonder if you might speak about your personal optimism or lack thereof related to changes being made at the national level. It strikes me as you spoke that many of the issues you related are not dissimilar to issues that still exist even in the US, including child marriage, lack of access to reliable energy and high rates of maternal mortality. Thank you for that question, Bethany. So, um, does anybody want to answer any of those questions or any other questions that were asked that you have follow on points for? I can speak to Tiffany and uh, Chris's question. I think those are really great questions. Um, I think one big way we can all contribute to this discussion is first and foremost, participating um, in the United Nations um, CSW uh, side events and parallel events. Um, this is like a really amazing opportunity, especially since it's virtual, anyone we can all join. 
um, to hear from the UN, NGOs, so many incredible advocates on, especially local organizations on what they're doing um, to uh, um, combat the effects of climate change against um, women and girls. Uh, I would also make sure to um, follow UNCSW on social media because throughout this month they've been posting their numerous opportunities also to engage online with um, other advocates. Um, and I think as a youth, um, I really want to emphasize the importance of encouraging youth advocates to join in on these discussions. Um, and one way we can do that is by um, advocating um, for the um, importance of um, K-12 climate education, which will help you know, students better understand the effects of climate change and become uh, innovative thinkers themselves of mitigation efforts. Um, and I think um, as, as someone who will be entering into um, graduating soon, um, I think that's important to recognize that climate change and, and environmental uh, disaster risk reduction are also um, emerging as uh, incredible like career opportunities that should be introduced uh, to more traditional, I guess, uh, career paths. Um, and then finally, I think um, for advocates in general is um, I think keeping an eye on funding. Um, I think we emphasize the importance of funding um, and the importance of um, when we see a national strategy um, on women's rights come out, making sure do we see um, actual funding, the language funding in it, do we see climate change in it, um, and I, I feel I am optimistic. I think um, 20, uh, in 2021, November, um, uh, USAID uh, Administrator Samantha Power um, announced um, a series of programs and targets um, specifically to advance um, uh, global action for um, climate equity. And um, that includes at least a $14 million um, dollar, um, in funding, which is amazing. Um, and I, I also just want to emphasize the importance of looking out for language, right? So when, you know, President Biden's national strategy on gender equality comes out, check to see if climate change is included because um, climate change and gender equality are so interconnected. Thank you, Annie. Any responses to the other questions posed? I can kind of answer Amalia's question. Um, so kind of related on the energy aspect, I was looking into a few different uh, civil society organizations and just organizations in general, um, specifically looking at the African Development Bank and the International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy, because they've been working a lot in um, seeing how gen the specific intersection of gender and energy affects rural women and just women in general in Africa. And a lot of their work in promoting this intersection has actually led to government initiatives, such as one done by Uganda, um, in that they're actually beginning to look into how women's access to clean energy in the form of what they say is like cooking stoves and lighting solutions will actually accelerate the progress towards gender equality in these regions and will increase um, economic participation. Um, and that's just one of the things where is actually helping the efforts, these efforts by organizations to help the national community. Um, and it's also helping like the international community because the African Development Bank works with a number of different countries. So they're working with partners as well, such as the UN, and they're looking into a number of different African countries, such as Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Uh, yeah, and I can jump in actually and provide an answer to this question in the case of Southeast Asia, um, specifically how national governments relationships with um, civil society groups affect the outcomes um, in, you know, in the case of Southeast Asia, we are witnessing right now a democratic uh, backsliding trend um, where national governments don't really have a good relationship with civil society organizations. Um, for example, in Thailand, the military junta um, seized power in 2014 from an elected government. Uh, the Myanmar uh, coup, which has been ongoing, has been something that's definitely caught the media's attention. Um, in Cambodia, the prime minister and the ruling party um, have driven the opposition members out of the country. And even in the regions, uh, more free nations like the Philippines, uh, like Indonesia, they still face significant threats to their democracy. So in various countries, civil society has been curtailed by governments who do use oppressive laws, 
um, you know, cut off funding and even harass civic actors who speak out, um, you know, against the country or against the government. So I think what is needed is uh, civil society organizations needing direct support to become more effective in holding governments accountable, um, advocating for women's rights, advocating for climate change um, and fostering democratic participation in those processes. And in terms of the question about your optimism more broadly, um, and you know, just the other questions that were asked, is there anything else that anybody wants to bring in before we wrap up this session? We only have a few minutes left. Do you each want um, to talk about, yeah, you want to answer the last question? Yeah, I'll just say something quick um, in terms of my personal optimism. So I personally am optimistic and try to remain optimistic despite that some days it feels harder than others to do so. Um, and I feel this is though because like, because we're the next generation and we hear this a lot, but we're the next generation that's going to be making these changes. And I've seen a lot of like-minded individuals as myself that are passionate about issues like this and advancing awareness and making tangible change and not just saying thoughts and prayers, but taking action and going to the streets when we're not happy about decisions by the administration. So I have optimism. Um, and I hear what you're saying about a lot of overlap um, between the US and the regions that we mentioned. And I think that that just goes to show that the entire world has these issues and has to adapt and learn and our um, the various national governments has to adapt and change to address these issues and protect um, and empower women across the globe because this isn't something that like the US or um, members of the EU can dismiss as saying that this isn't our issue, this is, um, we're developed nations, we are doing great. Like, no, all nations are struggling. This is a, um, a global climate issue. And I think that the only um, way to protect the inhabitants of the earth and ensure that women are getting not only a seat at the table and representation, but also um, protection and the necessary um, equipment they need to succeed and survive is to work um, together. And I think that our generation, fingers crossed, has the capabilities to do that and the passion to follow through. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think youth as well is really what gives me hope um, when we're discussing these issues. Uh, as in the case in Southeast Asia, actually more than half of the population is under 30 uh, and technology is shaping the way youth in the region live and work, um, even as they adapt to climate change um, and their own unique circumstances. And you know, in some ways these young people will inherit a better world than their parents knew with higher income potential, um, increased access to education and vast uh, technological possibilities. They'll also face serious issues such as the problem of climate change um, facing women and girls. But I think the, the youth population offers a glimpse of hope into what we're facing in the future. I honestly like couldn't say it better myself. Just like I, I am optimistic about like what the future will hold. And I just think the fact that like we as a group of students were both our panel and the previous panel wanted to come and like have this discussion is because it's something we're passionate about. And I think it's something that we will like bring about change in the future. And yeah, I'm just optimistic about the future. And Annie, would you like to make a comment before we close? Yeah, just to echo what everyone else has said. Um, I think youth are really going to be the next generation that is going to be pushing this. Um, and I think I'm already seeing it through um, the discussions that we're having right now, and uh, especially the discussions that um, we had um, in Dr. Graham's uh, class last semester. Well, I certainly have a lot of hope for the future because of all of you and all of the students in the previous panel and um, all of your energy and your passion and your excellent scholarship, of course, um, and hard work that you've put into preparing this panel, which is reflected in the questions you've been asked and the participation level. So I just want to thank again everybody for joining us here today and also mention that this group of students are going to be writing a policy brief 
um, on this panel. And if anybody wants to connect with the students and wants to provide any information, insights, case studies, examples, just in any way support the work they're doing, we'd love you to connect with us. Um, so I think our emails are available on the CSW website, but also if you want to put any emails in the chat box, um, we'll, we'll happily take them away and connect with you. Um, so just want to um, invite the panelists, if there's anything else any of you want to say before we close up today about the ongoing work on the policy brief or any other aspect um, of your work on this topic and um, your connection with our audience here today. Um, just okay. thank you. Oh, sorry. Just <laughs> thank you, um, everyone, for coming. Um, I appreciate you all taking the time and supporting us, um, friends, family, others. Um, it meant a lot, um, as well as this is only the beginning of this conversation. So take what you learned or thought of or maybe had more questions about and go out and do your own research so that this doesn't stop here. Fantastic closing remarks. Thank you so much, Jessa. Thank you, everybody. And again, I see some information has been put in the chat box, so you can link there and find our emails and connect with us directly. Please do stay in touch with us and continue this important conversation. Thank you and bye everybody.